In the last video about Gideon Ofnir, we went over how he could be the true villain in the world of Elden Ring, which is sort of odd to think since he's the leader of the Round Table Hold and seemingly tries to help us on our journey to becoming Elden Lord, feeding us constant information about where to go, what to do next, and who certain characters are. But in the end, he tries to stop us on that path. He's the all-knowing, the all-hearing, or at least that's what he calls himself. But how is he the all-knowing? How does he gather all of this information? To us, it seems like he never leaves the round table until we see him in the Ashen Capital City. Is he really just constantly reading everything he can learn in his study? Reading books on the history of everything throughout the lands between? Maybe he has some ability to gather information quickly or has eyes and ears all over the world. In the last Gideon video, we talked about how Gideon uses us to his advantage. He feeds us information about the demigods and where to find them along with their great runes, just so he can try and steal it all from us right before we reach the door of the Erd Tree. I call him the villain of Elden Ring, and I still believe this to be true. Now calling a character a villain is sort of pointless, as all of the characters in the game, including us, have our own aspirations of achieving our own goals and will clearly do anything to fulfill our destinies. If you've only played through the game once, you likely wouldn't notice that during Gideon's boss fight, his abilities can have a wide range depending on where you've ventured and which bosses you've defeated. If you've traveled to Mogwin's palace and defeated Moog, Gideon uses blood incantations related to Moog's moveset. Same goes as if you traveled to the Halig Tree and defeated Melania. He'll use Scarlet Rot in our fight against him, but that's only if we've traveled to those optional areas and defeated those optional bosses. Now, this is a video game, and we could just say this is because we've reached the end of the game, and going up against a boss who has a wide variety of attacks from enemies we've encountered throughout the game may makes a lot of sense. It would be the culmination of everything we've experienced in our playthroughs so far. But don't forget that this is from software, and everything we do, see, and interact with has a purpose. Some big and some small, but every situation has a purpose and a deeper meaning. So I believe there's a reason that Gideon has these new attacks, and that's because he's likely been stalking, observing, or spying on us during our journey. Every time we enter a new area, fight a new enemy, or defeat a boss, Gideon sees it all and adds it into his wide range of knowledge to eventually use it against us for his own benefit. If we look at this still image in the opening cutscene, we can see Gideon laying in a coffin filled with eyes and ears. Considering he is the all-hearing and all-knowing, this branding of eyes and ears is very fitting. I also have this small theory that the painter we interact with throughout the game is the person who painted these opening cutscenes. There's basically nothing that proves this, I just like to believe this to be true. I just think some of the images that we see in the opening cutscene are exaggerated in some ways, and as an example, having Gideon in a coffin filled with eyes and ears. This could be where he woke up as a tarnished, or it's just an exaggerated painting by the painter that we see throughout the game. That's just my little theory, take it or leave it. But the all-knowing armor set continues to showcase this brand, with eyes on the midsection and stacks of ears outlining the bottom. This armor set reads, Armor set with countless eyes and ears, worn by Gideon Ofnir, the all-knowing. Knowledge begins with the recognition of one's ignorance, the realization that the search for knowledge is unending. So Gideon is representing what he wishes to be, the all-knowing. The name Gideon Ofnir could potentially come from two different references. If we look into Norse mythology, Ofnir is one of the many nicknames given to Odin, who is known as the all-knowing of the Norse gods, who would use the eyes of ravens to spy and gather information. The name Gideon could also come from a species of beetle, known as Xylotrope's Gideon. When seeing this, I immediately think of the Crimson Tear Scarabs, which while looking like a certain type of beetle, also has an image of an eye seemingly drawn onto it. Some of these beetles have different images of drawings on them, but I've also noticed these beetles change form and size, and when they do this, that image changes back to the insignia of an eye, which I believe references Gideon. The next step in looking into Gideon would be looking at the description of items that have this symbol. While none of the Scarab descriptions reference Gideon, the I Surcoat armor set reads, 
brown surcoat draped over chainmail. The insignia emblazoned on the front marks out the wearer as the eyes and ears of Sir Gideon the All-Knowing. This tells us that Gideon uses this insignia to label his spies that he can use to gather information from all over the lands between. Just like how Odin uses ravens, Gideon uses these beetles to spy on us and our journey to obtain information without putting himself at risk. It's possible he needs to label these beetles with this eye insignia for him to be able to spy or observe, because labeling things you intended to use as spies is pretty counterintuitive. Or Gideon just doesn't care that we know he's watching us since he does try to help us as well with these beetles since they drop valuable items for us to use. I believe some of these beetles are native to the lands between, but are used by Gideon to obtain as much knowledge as possible so he can truly be all-knowing, or as close as he can to that. But there are certain areas where Gideon's beetles are either scarce to find or just are not there at all. There are no beetles in Mogwin's palace, the Halig tree, the deep root depths, and very few at the mountaintops of the giants. Now it's important to note that Gideon is just known as the all-knowing. Think of it like a nickname. It doesn't mean he knows everything. In fact, he asks us to tell him if we learn anything new, and he rewards us for doing so. This new information that we can tell him just so happens to be info on Mog and Mogwin's palace, Oh, so that's where the so-called Lord of Blood was hiding himself, eh? A fitting little squat for that deluded maniac to bleat about the revival of his precious dynasty while he turns our fellow tarnished into bloody fingers. Let him stay there. That way, his delusions will remain as they are, distant and unattainable. But perhaps it's worth looking into. If what I've heard is right, then maybe. Ah, my apologies. Lost myself for a moment there. And we can also give him new information on the Halig Tree and Mikola after defeating Melania. So, the Halig Tree. Now but a husk. I heard speculation Mikola embedded himself in the Halig Tree. But before he could finish, someone cut the tree open and absconded with his infant form. Indeed, it seems those words held weight. How vexing that the All-Knowing didn't have the full story. Perhaps the Queen's sorrow was justified. Ah, my apologies. Lost myself for a moment there. One thing you may be asking yourself is why are there different images on the scarabs? If he was using them to spy on us, wouldn't he just use one type of insignia? Now this is just speculation on my part, but I mentioned briefly earlier, these insignias sometimes change from one image back to the eye on certain scarabs. I believe Gideon masks some of these spying beetles in an attempt to trick us or steer our suspicions of Gideon using these beetles to watch and observe us. It wouldn't be the first time he tells us one thing in order to make us think one way and then flip it against us. The greatest example of this is when we fight against him. Up to this point, it's kind of already known that Gideon is seemingly watching our progress through the lands between. It doesn't seem like he's trying too hard to hide this. And I thought maybe he was just too old or too weak to go out into the world and fight against these monstrosities and powerful demigods that we fight against. But I started to think otherwise when I looked deeper into what Gideon was causing. Gideon slaughtered these people in the village of the Albanorix in order to find the secret medallion to the Halig tree. We can learn more from Albus, a surviving Albanorix disguised as a pot. We're finished. The whole village is finished. The curse mongers have destroyed everything. No one that remains has their wits about them. I beg you. Would you look after this medallion? You must keep it out of the curse mongers' hands. And if you should meet the young Albinorek Latena, then please give it to her. When we find Latena near this area, she tells us more of what Gideon did here, killing her wolf. Lobo in search of the medallion. Foul tarnished. What do you want? I told the all-hearing brute that I possess no such medallion. Or have you come to take more from me? Was my other half not enough? And when his adoptive daughter hears what Gideon has done, she confronts him, 
only to be cast aside as he has no need for her anymore. And I can no longer trust in Father to think he'd order his men to enact such tragedy. Where is the justice he purports in that? He once told me that if he became Elden Lord, he would never allow the downtrodden to be cheated ever again. Was he simply lying to me? He also, more than likely, tries to kill us after we obtain the first half of this medallion, having his bodyguard, Insha, attack us when we return to the round table hold with it. After we kill Insha, Gideon then tries to blow it off as Insha acted on his own, even though he references that Insha got ahead of himself when attacking us, indicating that killing us was a part of the plan just at a later date. Oh, my apologies for that nasty business. Insha got rather ahead of himself, it seems. As his master, I'd like to express my regret. But now, Ensha is slain and gone. Finished. Forevermore. What we can take from this is that Gideon is ruthless in his quest to become Elden Lord, killing or casting aside those who defy or question his pursuits of knowledge. But the question still stands as to why he tries to stop us. You could think at this point that he has to stop us before we reach the Erd Tree and seek an audience with Queen Merica. If he doesn't stop us here, then we have the best chance of becoming Elden Lord. And we've known from the start that he himself wants to become Elden Lord. I am known as Gideon Ofnir, as a tarnished who wishes to stand before the Elden Ring and become Elden Lord. I am accumulating knowledge to be all-knowing. This was likely his intentions from the start of our journey, but as time went on, those intentions changed after looking into Queen Merica's plan. We can see this when we read further into Gideon's armor set, which reads, But when Gideon glimpsed into the will of Queen Merica, he shuddered in fear at the end that should not be. And when we meet him in battle before the Queen's bedchamber, he not only wants to stop us, but to stop anyone, including himself, from becoming Elden Lord. Ah, I knew you'd come to stand before the Elden Ring, to become Elden Lord. What a sad state of affairs. I commend your spirit, but alas, none shall take the throne. Queen Marika has high hopes for us, that we continue to struggle. Unto eternity. If you want more information on Queen Merica's plan, at least my interpretation of it, go watch my video called Queen Merica's Perfect Plan. Her plan, to put it bluntly, wants us to try to become Elden Lord, but we must first earn that right through proving ourselves as the strongest by fighting against the strongest and mending not only the Elden Ring, but proving that we can fix the lands between as well and can control the greater will. With all this said, I still can't figure out if Gideon just let Godfrey go ahead of him or he just hadn't reached him yet and instead waited to kill us before him which would sort of go against what he's been doing since the start of the game, using us to do most of the hard work in killing the demigods and obtaining their great runes to mend the Elden Ring back together. But Gideon doesn't believe that a man, or a tarnished, can kill a god. I know in my bones a tarnished cannot become a lord. Not even you, a man, cannot kill a god. Godfrey is known as the first tarnished, banished from the lands between by Queen Merica herself to battle and become stronger in lands far away. So, at least from what he says when we kill him, Gideon doesn't think even Godfrey can become Elden Lord. So this could be why he tries to stop us first, before moving on to try and stop Godfrey as well. Gideon still is, in my opinion, one of the most villainous characters in all of Elden Ring. But of course, everyone in the Lands Between seems like a villain. Maybe he's just misunderstood, maybe he's just been manipulated, maybe Queen Merica cast a curse on Gideon to just turn on us in such a hard way. All of these speculations are possible, but we just don't know for sure, nor are we supposed to know everything. Either way, Gideon makes me very uncomfortable in regards to everything we've talked about, and especially after hearing this piece of dialogue regarding Rani. Tarnished, a word. I hear you conspired with Rani the Witch. I understand. 
The need for puppet gash is strong. Do you think I've not felt it? In my quest to be all-knowing, I too have known the draw to the blue cunny. With her four arms, think of all the things that she can do to it. Your tarnished tackle. And then, imagine ten more. Just tell me this. When she was miniature and in your grasp, did you stick her in a jar? And did you fill that jar with your tarnished seed? I'd do the same if given the chance. Be on your way then to the capital. Thank you all for watching the video and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. My goal is to get my percentage of subscribers to viewers ratio up to 50% by the end of the year. Right now we're at 12%, which considering this percentage was at 2% just over a month ago, we are definitely on the right track. Thanks again, everybody. And I will see you all in the next video. Take care.